Hello, friends, and welcome back to a second study in a series on the minor prophets of the Old Testament, which I think on the whole are least read. And yet there is much to learn from them in regard to messianic prophecy already fulfilled by Jesus Christ and end times prophecy, particularly about the day of the Lord to be fulfilled. And considering the signs of the times, followers of Christ would find encouragement from both the major and minor prophets. And before we examine Joel, which you will find to be superbly written in the form of a sermon and in the style of Hebraic poetry, it is helpful to know a bit of the historical background on the times in which Joel prophesied. And like the other writers of the scriptures, we know little about the prophet Joel, other than he was the son of Pethuel of the tribe of Judah, who was also unknown. And outside of Joel and the book of Acts, he is not mentioned again. There are other Joels in the Old Testament, but no connection has been made to any of them to this prophet. And Joel is thought to be one of the earliest of the minor prophets of the southern kingdom, who prophesied during the reign of King Joash in the ninth century before Christ. Yet some place him during the late pre-exilic period of 605 to 586 BC, while others argue for a post-exilic date, perhaps during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah of the fifth century BC. And this would have been decades after the exiled Jews returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple under the edict of King Cyrus of Persia in 536 BC. But since the compilers of the Old Testament placed the book of Joel in second place after Hosea, and that there is little in Joel that dates this prophet, I will go with the ninth century dating for this study. And what we know about the spiritual condition of Judah at that time is that they had turned from worshiping Jehovah to the Canaanite idols, primarily Baal and his consort Asherah, the shrines of which had not been destroyed by King Joash, 1 Kings 12. And according to Joel, Judah had a great locust plague, perhaps the extent of which had not been seen in Israel before. And although the locusts prefigure the end times armies, Joel is speaking about an actual locust plague, which he indicates was Jehovah's attempt to get Judah's attention for them to repent and return to him. And unlike most of the other prophets, Joel was successful in doing so. And to give you a sense of what that locust plague was probably like, Soon after the end of the Civil War, in 1873, and again in 1877, the Rocky Mountain locust plagues resulted in the loss of $200 million worth of crop damage in at least five states. The severe food shortage and loss of income had been devastating, with not only the grain crop devoured, but leather, wood, sheep wool, and even the clothes on people's backs. The 19th century writer of Little House on the Prairie, Laura Ingalls Wilder, bore witness to these plagues, writing, The wake of the locust depredation was starvation and deprivation. Waterways were polluted with locust excrement. All that was available to eat were locusts, which were taken up by wild animals and domesticated ones. The result was bloating and inedible meat. And in its math aftermath, Wilder went on to say, the whole prairie was changed. The grasses did not wave. They had fallen in ridges. The rising sun made all the prairie rough with shadows where the tall grasses had sunk against each other. The willow trees were bare. In the plum thickets, only a few plum pits hung to the leafless branches. The nipping, clicking, gnawing sound of the grasshoppers eating was still going on. In Joel, the Lord refers to the plague devourers as a fierce nation, and I quote, for a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made white. 1, 6, and 7. 
And if the locusts weren't bad enough, the palmer worm, the canker worm, and the caterpillars finish off all that they have left behind. Joel 1.4. The grain, olives, grapes, pomegranates, and figs were staples of the ancient Israelites. And so the Lord appeals to Judah through his servant Joel that they repent. And I quote, Now therefore says the Lord, Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. 2, 12 and 13. And under the power of the Holy Spirit, Joel appears to the people to take action, saying, Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babies, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? 2, 14 through 17. And evidently, Judah repented for Jehovah promised to restore them, while revealing his nature of compassion and mercy, who was always willing to forgive his repentant people, and promising, and I quote, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations, but I will remove far from you the northern army and will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea. His stench will come up and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. 2, 19 and 20. The northern army here refers to that of the northern kingdom of Israel who remained at enmity with Judah until 722 BC when their capital city, Samaria, fell to their oppressor, the Assyrians. And then Joel continues, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field, for the open pastures are springing up, and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully, and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with new wine and oil. 2, 21 through 24. And again, Jehovah speaks through Joel, declaring something many of us have heard from the pulpit uh, to encourage those who have lost much in their lives. And I quote, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army, which I sent among you. And here is confirmed that Jehovah was the source of the plague. And Jehovah continues to promise his people, saying, You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. 2, 25-27 and it was to Joel whom Jehovah revealed the coming of the Holy Spirit, fulfilled seven centuries later in the upper room in Jerusalem during the Feast of Pentecost, but to increase among God's people greatly in the end times. And I quote, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. 
your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Verses 28 and 29. And Jehovah continues, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Verses 30 and 31. And what I love about the Bible is the connectivity between the Old and New Testaments, where they prove one another. And this is certainly the case with the phrase, Day of the Lord, found in Joel, along with the prophets Isaiah, Amos, Obadiah, Zephaniah, Zechariah, and Malachi, as well as in the New Testament, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Peter, and of course throughout the book of Revelation, referred to as the Day of Wrath. The first time the phrase, the day of the Lord, is mentioned is in the first book of the prophets, the book of Isaiah, 13, 6 through 13. And I quote him, Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. It, therefore all hands will be limp, every man's heart will melt, and they will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, and with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a mortal more rare than fine gold, a man more than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. And the prophet Amos foretold of the day of the Lord. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion and a bear met him. Or as though he went into the house, leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? Amos 5, 16 through 20. And in the New Testament, Paul mentions the day of the Lord, and I quote him, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. And Peter agrees, prophesying, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with the roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat. Second Peter 3, 10 and 12. And in the book of Revelation, the day of the Lord is referred to as the wrath of God. And it says, from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. Revelation 19, 15. I hope that this has been informative and encouraging to you, and that no matter how heinous your sins might be, the Lord Jesus Christ is always willing to forgive and restore you when you repent of your sins. That is to turn away from sinning and to follow him, Joel preached. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, 2.28. And this was repeated by Luke in Acts 2.21 and Paul in Romans 10.13. 
If you have not made peace with the Lord, don't procrastinate. Do that today. Receive his forgiveness and know that your eternal destination is with him.